didn't think so. <laughs> okay, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the January meeting of the New York State Joint Commission on Public Ethics. Uh, notwithstanding that it's the end of the month already, I will wish everybody Happy New Year. Since we haven't seen each other since last year, um, let's get on with business. Behind attachment A, we need uh, a motion to approve the minutes from the December public session. We need to make one change to these minutes um, on page. Sorry, where is uh, page two at the bottom? The motion made by Commissioner Yates in the executive session was seconded by Commissioner Fisher, not Commissioner Weissman. With that change, is there a motion to approve? I'll make that thank motion. You, Commissioner Fisher. Second. Second. Commissioner Weissman, thank you. All in favor? New York City. Albany. WebEx. And WebEx. Okay. Okay. Item three on the agenda report from staff. Thank you. Uh, for outreach, um, we held our annual. Uh, Ethics Officer Forum on Financial Disclosure Statements on January 16th. There were 44 attendees, uh, either live or via WebEx. Always a rousing discussion on uh, the financial disclosure process. Uh, the Commission issued its fall winter newsletter on December 19th. There will be a, uh, a spring edition coming shortly, I, I gather. And on February 5th, uh, the Commission will host a training program on the, both the comprehensive lobbying regulations and the lobbying application filing system. The program will be at the Empire State Plaza in the concourse and the meeting rooms. Uh, Pre-registration is required. Right now we have over 230 people registered while there is ample space for more. Uh, for those who cannot attend, uh, the program will be videotaped and posted to the Commission's website after the fact. Um, so that's outreach. Before we go into the financial report, uh, I wanted to let the Commission know that uh, the Governor's proposed budget for fiscal year 2021, 2020, and 2021 includes an appropriation for JCOPE of $5.582 million. This is unchanged from current levels uh, of $4.682 million in personnel and $900,000 in non-personal service. Um, so, as, as mentioned, that is going to be a flat budget as proposed uh, by the governor. I'll now turn it over to Steve Boland to go over the third quarter report. Thank you, Martin. Uh, as of December 31st, which is the third quarter of the fiscal year, uh, the commission spent uh, $1,189,000 in personal services and $209,000 in non-personal service for a total of $1,398,000 for the quarter. Uh, year to date, that brings us for personal services to 3489000 which is 75% of our, our cash budget for the year, and 497000 in NPS, which represents 54% of our cash for the year. Uh, so total expenditures amounted to 3987000 and the percentage we spent in cash is 72.1%, so we're under budget. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Item four, uh, regulations. Okay, so the... Hold on, hold on. Uh, Commissioner Weissman has his hand up, Mr. Chairman. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I have a quick question for uh, staff regarding the 2021 budget. If it's a flat budget, do we have to, uh, are any raises, how are the raises going to be dealt with, if there are any? Uh, the uh, negotiated um, cost of living adjustments and performance advances, uh, well, cost of living is negotiated, performance advances are, are not. Those are, um, those have not been addressed in our proposed budget. Obviously, the agency will be on the hook for those. We have let the Department of Budget, Division of the Budget, know that uh, 
you know, as proposed, those would put us in a, uh, in a negative position. So we're hoping to engage them in a discussion to ensure that either before the budget is passed or as part of a supplemental that uh, we're, uh, we're addressed for, this gets addressed for next year. But we have let them know of this. Uh, RPS and what RPS will end up being with the uh, raises and I know it's hard to do performance advances. Yeah, I can't. Um, I, I don't have the 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 cost of living alone at my fingertips, Commissioner. I can. I'd be happy to go over those numbers after the meeting. They're all on the computer upstairs. Uh, but as I I believe the last time I looked at it. We were expecting to break even this year without next year's advances, and so it would just be the the delta over what's changing between this year and next. We basically, my point is, we have we had no margin this year. Uh, but like I said, I'm happy to go over those with you either after the meeting or at the next meeting, whatever is preferable to you. Well, it's, it's just important for uh, everyone to know that. Uh, so our operations can be hamstrung going forward in the future if, uh, if we have issues in terms of uh, retaining or getting new staff as staff turnover occurs. So, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Okay, regulations? So. Uh, Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Carol's going to go over uh, a couple of things, but I wanted to just kind of lead in with, with some comments. You know, the, 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 the lobbying regulations are the, as, as we've said over and over, are the first set of comprehensive regulations for lobbying in the state, um, you know, after 40 years of, of the, the industry being regulated by various entities. So we've got a, we've got a year under our belts now with these regulations. And as a result, uh, we're, what we're going to be proposing uh, in the forthcoming weeks and months is a series of updates and clarifications to reflect some of the experiences we've had. Uh, some of this is editorial cleanup that we knew we would have to do. Um, others are policy issues that we'd like to reconsider in light of how things have gone. And then some are more sort of technical compliance issues that um, go to the specifics of how the industry conducts business. Uh, and facilitating getting that, you know, sort of reflected accurately in the filings. Uh, Carol Quinn is going to give an overview of the more prominent changes that are coming. Uh, we are finalizing the text of the regulations, and we'll be distributing that over the next few weeks. Uh, after the commission approves a draft, we will commence a formal rulemaking, uh, or revised rulemaking as it stands, uh, with ample notice and public comment periods. Um, but for today, like I said, Carol Quinn, our Deputy Director of Lobbying, is going to go over some of the, the bigger issues that will be addressed in the revised rulemaking. Uh, so, Carol, please. And uh, we, we anticipate the rulemaking hopefully to be in effect uh, January of 2021, um, which would be logical in a way because it would be the start of the next biennial period. So some of the issues we plan to tackle are with social media. This would be a big change. Uh, we would, we're drafting language that would make personal social media posts presumptively not reportable lobbying. So this wouldn't be reportable by an individual or by the organization. It would only be reportable if the person is actually hired to run the social media campaign through their personal social media platforms. So that would be a big change. Um, another change uh, to Carol, grassroots. Just to clarify, when an organization has its own social media activities, those are still covered, am I correct? That's correct. We're talking about personal, an individual's personal social media uh, posts or tweets that they do on their own, not the organization's tweets, not the organization's social media. So Thank as you. A, as a test case, uh, real Donald Trump, is that personal or business? No comment. <laughs> No, I mean, seriously, like, how, how do we, is there a clear way for staff to differentiate between someone who's a public figure uh, who is using social media clearly as part of 
Yeah, the organization. Well, those are the, the we're, we are working on that language and working on how to differentiate those type of things, and it is complicated. Um, but we, we are we are starting from, whereas before we had a presum we had here's how it could be captured personal social media posts now we're flipping that to say it's presumptively not reportable lobbying so it would not be reportable by the organization or by an individual their own personal posts but that's like Martin uh, clarified that's not an organization's social media platform that would still be covered if it meets the criteria of direct lobbying for example and it meets all the criteria we have in the regulation okay yeah, that seems to make sense. Okay, so that's one change we're thinking about for social media. The other, another change is in grassroots lobbying. Uh, this would, would provide that no individual people, no persons, no individuals would be required to be listed as individual lobbyists based on their grassroots lobbying activity alone. And the idea behind this is when we're talking about grassroots lobbying, the message is public. The focus is not really on the individuals behind it, but instead on who is paying for that grassroots lobbying message. So individuals would not have to be listed. The entity would still be the principal, whoever the principal lobbyist obviously would be on the filing, but the individual lobbyist, there would not have to be any individual lobbyist listed uh, based on just grassroots lobbying activity alone. It would also clarify how grassroots lobbying can be engaged in by an individual on behalf of himself and by an organization on behalf of the organization. So those two changes in social media and grassroots lobbying, that's going to go a long way to streamlining and simplifying the regulations. And obviously we'll show you language, but those are the type of key changes we're, we're uh, talking about. Uh, we also have more changes relating more to the compliance or Hold filing. on one sec. Yes? Hold on one sec. One sec. Commissioner Yates, you have a question? Yeah, I, I may be confusing two different sections, but correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, we call a board a board member of a not-for-profit who neither expends nor receives money, just a volunteer board member, a, quote, designated lobbyist. So does that person have to be listed in the grassroots lobbying efforts? No, no individuals would be listed on their grassroots lobbying. Not a designated lobbyist, not an employed lobbyist. No, no persons would be listed on the filing for grassroots lobbying. That's separate and apart from direct lobbying. For direct lobbying, that person would have to be listed. If they engage if, in direct lobbying. Correct. If they, if they engage in direct lobbying. And, and if the organization on the board of which they sit expends more than $5,000 on lobbying. But just so I'm clear then, on the direct lobbying, um, I'm a board member for a volunteer fire company that's pretty small upstate or whatever. I do it on a part-time volunteer basis. I have a friend who's a legislator. I talk to my friend who's a legislator, and I say, you know, you really ought to give more money to volunteer or more help to volunteer fire companies. Um, <coughs> is that person then listed as a designated lobbyist, even though... That person never received money, never spent money, and wasn't asked to lobby by the organization. Well, the entity itself is the one that you're looking at first. Are they the are they a registered lobbyist? Meaning that yeah, they they've spent five thousand. They've spent. Yeah, they, yeah the, why why a missing uh, fire company spends five thousand and one dollars? Mm -hmm. Okay, so they're already registered. Then then anyone who is a designated lobbyist of the of the entity would be lit and they engage in one cc activity lobbying activity that yes they would be listed this this is based on a an explicit provision in in the lobbying act which s provides that in the statement of registration any person who engages in lobbying activities on behalf of the organization is required to be disclosed uh, uh, on the filing uh, this is this isn't a, a discretionary on behalf of the organization. That's why I'm saying, even though it's not at the behest of the organization, my hypothetical, or to their friends, and one turns to the other and says, you know, you really ought to look out for volunteer fire companies. Um, that person would then be a designated lobbyist. That's our... I think, I think the answer would... Go ahead, sorry, Martin. 
generally the, the answer would be, be yes. The idea being when someone wears the hat of a board member, uh, whether it's a fire hat or any other hat, uh, they are carrying with that the fiduciary responsibility and the uh, imprimatur of the organization. And it, our position would be, and, and granted this is just our proposal and has been in part of the regulations, that that person with that authority can't take that hat off. And when they wear that, they have, they are engaging on behalf of the organization. We differentiate that from volunteer members because the board member does carry with it that authority to speak on behalf of the organization. Okay, well, maybe at a later time, the, the full commission should talk about that and we should get public testimony. But it seems to me it should be at the behest of or in coordination with the, red, with the entity but otherwise, in my hypothetical, I'm better off, if I care about volunteer firefighters, I'm better off not being on the board, even as a volunteer. Anyway. Well, obviously, we are planning to present these regulations to the commission, and the commission can have that full debate at that time and decide on a recourse how they want to move forward. Um, we're balancing the concerns that Commissioner Yates is raising against the public's interest in knowing about these meetings when they take place and any attempts to influence, you know, legislation or public policy. So I think those are both valid interests that have to be discussed and, and that, that we're hoping to start the presentation of these at the February meeting and there can be more discussion at that time. Thank you. Okay, please continue. Well, that leads into some of the changes we're making. Some of them are policy related, some are more compliance or like how you file, um, <coughs> how you report lobbying activity and designated lobbyist is, is was next on my list. Um, and so again, up for discussion uh, and you'll see the language hopefully in February, but we were going to clarify that a person can designate themselves to lobby on their own behalf. So they could be their own designated lobbyist and also that organizations can designate a person to lobby on behalf of the organization, which would include board members uh, or officers or similar uh, situated parties. That would be in the designated lobbyist definition and, you know, would carry throughout the regulation. <coughs> Another clarifying point on beneficial clients, we've gotten a lot of questions on the um, dealing with corporate structure. So the parent subsidiary situation and when must a subsidiary be listed as a beneficial client on a filing and there's a lot of variations between parents, parent corporations, subsidiary corporations and we've gotten quite a bit of questions on that. So we're hoping to try and provide some clarification in the regulation on, you know, when a subsidiary should be listed as a beneficial client. You know, to the extent that a regulation can answer every question, we're, we're, we're debating on that and, and just trying to provide some more clarification on that. On contractual clients, we're also considering clarifying that the contractual client is not necessarily, usually does, but isn't necessarily the one who actually pays the lobbyists. Again, the parent subsidiary might be an example of that. Uh, the contractual client is, is the one who enters into the agreement to, with the lobbyist to lobby. Uh, and typically they also pay, but not necessarily. So that's a clarification we're looking at, at making uh, with contractual clients. Dealing with coalitions, so the definition of a coalition refers to pooling funds. Are there any questions on that? Okay. Uh, pooling funds, and our position and interpretation of that has been to pool funds and resources. So for example, if an entity incurs an expense on behalf of the coalition, we interpret that to be a contribution to the coalition. And it would also make you a member of the coalition. So it's not only do you provide money, but you provide resources. Um, we're, we're looking at clarifying that situation for coalitions. We have gotten some questions on that as well. Any questions on any of that before I go forward? Okay. Um, so those are kind of the key areas we're thinking about. Uh, there's, I'm sure, more some more technical things we'll, we'll set forth, but those are the key areas we're talking about clarifying uh, after a year has gone by on the lobbying regulations. 
We're also, and we brought this to the commission's attention previously, but we're, we're considering revising the source of funding regulations. That's part 938 uh, to accomplish two things that we've discussed previously. The idea of excluding from source of funding disclosure contributions that are specifically earmarked for activity outside of New York State and that are restricted from use in the general funds. So here we're talking about contributions that the contributor intended it to fund activities outside the, of New York <coughs> and the recipient set up a structure to restrict its use to outside of the state. Um, that's one area. The other clarification is about anonymous sources and that basically anonymous sources would not be allowed. Mm -hmm. uh, they have to, you know, a source has to be disclosed. It cannot be listed as anonymous. So those, you know, those are some areas uh, in the lobbying regulations and the, the two clarifications in source of funding, dealing with contributions. Those are the areas that we're, we're drafting on. Um, and we just wanted today to give you an idea of what we're looking at and we'll get you the draft of language as soon as we can and hopefully present on that again in February in more detail. Does anyone have any questions? Okay, thank you very much. Next, attachment B, the proposed advisory opinion. So, um, staff have presented um, a draft of a proposed advisory opinion for the commission's discussion and consideration. Uh, the opinion is intended to provide clarity on the commission on gifts that are solicited for or offered to third parties, which can include charities and state agencies. I'm going to turn it over to the Deputy Director of Ethics Guidance, Michael Sand, to provide an overview of the substance of the draft. Thank you. Uh, as Monica said, the proposed opinion discusses the gift restrictions that apply to public officials and lobbyists and their clients, and more specifically, how it apply to indirect <coughs> An indirect gift is one that is made or Can offered you speak up a little louder? Yeah, I don't know. That's a pretty good idea. Yeah, take that off mute. It's me. 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 It's me.
to investigate whether the gift was made at an official's direction, designation, recommendation, or on an official's behalf. This opinion sets forth a non-exhaustive list of circumstantial factors that are relevant to such a determination. These factors include the nature and substance of the solicitation, the nature and purpose of the gift, the nature and purpose of the third party recipient, the public official's knowledge of the identity of the donor, the nature of the gift offeror's official business, if any, that is pending before the public official, the extent and nature of any nexus between the solicitation and the pending business, and the offeror's history of making similar gifts. Moreover, the restrictions on gifts are not limited to personal solicitations. Under the law, a state official cannot knowingly use or permit an intermediary to solicit an otherwise impermissible gift. An intermediary could be someone whom the public official has designated, authorized, or knowingly permitted to act on their behalf. The gift restrictions apply when the facts demonstrate that an intermediary is, by all appearances, acting for a public official. These factors are not ranked. No one factor is dispositive. While in any specific case, one or more factors may emerge as particularly important or persuasive, such matters will be determined, case by case, upon a totality of the circumstances basis. It is staff's hope that this advisory opinion will be a resource to those who consider soliciting a gift to a third party or making a gift to a third party identified by a public official or using an intermediary to solicit a gift. Question. <clears throat> Mr. Weissman has his hand up. Uh, Michael, how are 501c3s treated? Gifts to 501c3s would be examined under uh, the totality of circumstances uh, paradigm. I mean, the, the opinion is, is not intended to, to discourage charitable giving in any way, but they, they would be subject to the same analysis. Um, I concur that uh, it's important for 501c3s to be able to obtain contributions and donations to keep their charitable missions going. I'm a little concerned at how the language has slightly changed uh, I think uh, I may have seen an earlier version that I thought had a better balancing test regarding 501c3, and I would strongly recommend that uh, we re-examine how we treat 501c3 so they don't, so it doesn't appear that there's an that there is a pass for a donation, uh, as you're probably well aware. For any number of years now, the Internal Revenue Service has been looking into uh, various uh, of all political stripes, 501c3s, that have, may have, uh, let's say, just straight beyond their mission uh, in, into a realm where uh, they, may, they probably shouldn't be. And I think it's important that uh, we reflect that in this opinion. Um, so, I don't, can you hear me from down here? Mm-hmm. Yes. Can you commit hear me okay? Yes. Okay. So, um, among other things, I, th- I believe, and, and Commissioner Weissman, I don't, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but one of the recent changes that staff has made to this advisory opinion is to add a sentence on the bottom, um, at the top of page eight. As a general matter, gifts to a long-standing charity, a 501c3 organization, will likely overcome the presumption. And so the idea here was that if, um, as I understand, it's pretty common that there often are community events that elected officials attend um, for longstanding community charities and other types of charitable entities that there are often fundraising activities for, that, that, that under most circumstances, those will overcome the presumption. But of course, we're going to look at the totality of circumstances. And depending on the pending business and the nature of the solicitation, like we said, the nexus to that pending business, it it might not overcome the presumption. But the the idea of that language was to give some comfort so that we don't get flooded with calls from lobbyists and clients and other interested sources when they are asked to contribute to 
you know, the, uh, the Red Cross or a blood drive or some local cause um, that, that they would be concerned about giving. Um, if, if that particular sentence gives cause to commissioners, we can take that sentence out, but that was a new addition to the advisory opinion, um, and, and so we understand that commissioners may need, might have concerns about it, and, and that's fine. Yeah, because Monica, I don't understand what cause, uh, can you give me a definition of what constitutes a long-standing charity? I mean, I know the Red Cross might be one, okay, but uh, is it one year, three years, five years? Is it is it going to be something that was uh, unincorporated as a 501c3 that was just being done and then all of a sudden got incorporated? I, I mean, I'm just not comfortable with, with the language, the way it's drafted, and it <coughs> appears it can be read, or misread, I should say, to appear to give somebody a pass. And I think, I think it just needs to be sharpened up. There was other language that I saw that was, uh, was, that was more appropriate in both that and an earlier footnote that was that I think would uh, work better. May I ask a question, Mr. Chairman? Go ahead. Could you elaborate, Monica, on the juxtaposition between the proposition of surmounting a assumption and the sentence that says 501c3s will be subject to less scrutiny. I'm not sure I quite follow how this is all supposed to work. Can, can I can I interject? Sure. Um, as a former staff member who was responsible in part for some of the drafting of the rules, uh, um, I, I don't really, I can tell you how it works, and I don't think this language changes anything, as Michael said. Uh, this language is merely describing an, inter an analysis that the staff would undertake were it presented with a question. One of the factors might be the charity in question. How long has the charity been around? How long has it been established? It is not a binary um, output. It is not, is it long standing or not? It is, has the charity been around for a year? That might, that might make a difference. That might, that might, give, uh, that might be important to the analysis if it, as opposed to a charity that was around for 10 years or five years or two years or three years. This language is merely descriptive of the process by which the staff operates today. Which and it's piece are you reading to? The same sentence I'm talking about, right, but Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at page nine. Yeah, no, no, the, the page nine. A long-standing charity formed under 501C3 of the Internal Revenue Code would be subject to less scrutiny than a, and it goes on, and it, and it goes uh, on. Where is the phrase about overcoming a presumption? Well, that's, that's the... That's the overarching page eight. structure that for that. that. Uh, the specific language I was talking about was at the top of page eight, but the opinion... So our regulations and create if 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 a interested source is is directly solicited by an elected official, there would be a presumption that the gift is impermissible, and so it's about overcoming that presumption. But I want, based on your experience on the staff, is it fair to say? that the exercise of analysis is separate from the proposition that a long-standing charity will overcome the presumption. My, my point being is, is that why are we saying that the 501c3 will be subject to less scrutiny? They have the same scrutiny for all entities, but say that if it's a, the conclusion of the premise is if it's a long-standing charity, it will likely overcome the presumption. What I, what I object to is less group. Now, it also raises the question, and my memory is not serving me uh, exceptionally well today, but didn't the Conflicts of Interest Board address this specifically? They, did, they didn't make this distinction, did they? Or did they? They look at the entire situation slightly different than we do, and they have a different law. They do make a distinction between um, 
certain types of not-for-profit, for example, the Mayor's Fund for uh, New York City, which I believe, it, it, I believe in the, in the guidance, they, make, they explain that that is something different than other not-for-profits. They were not serving, really they, they the, they were serving the needs of city purpose. Exactly. I, I understand that distinction. But did, they, did the Conflict of Interest Board make a distinction between a 501c3 and a 501c4 with respect to the manner and degree with which the circumstance would be scrutinized? I would have to re-examine those advisories. No, that's fair enough. And I don't they are in the process of issuing new regulations uh, on this very issue. I mean, I mean, maybe a better way to phrase this is that a a a gift, and this will be a slightly imprecise here, but a gift given to a um, to a charity formed under Section 501c3 of the Internal Revenue Code would be less likely, would, would be more likely to comply with the uh, regulations or the prohibitions uh, the longer it has been in existence or, or something along those lines. But I, I think, I think that, so maybe scrutiny is, is not particular, is not the, the most accurate description of what the staff, or the, the method, or the, the method by which the staff engages in its in its review, um, but it, what it's meant to, I think what it's meant to capture is this idea that a long-standing uh, 501c3, that a gift given to a long-standing 501c3 has a greater likelihood of complying with the regulations than does a gift given to a 501c3 that might have just been created in the past month, for instance, or the past year. All right, let's, <clears throat> let's do this. Let's table this right now. There's obviously language that needs to be worked through. So, Mike and staff, why don't you all come back to us with some additional or change language that might address this question. Any other? Go ahead, Commissioner Yates. Uh, I have another question. I realize that the tech, I'm, a, I'm going to ask questions about interested stores. And I realize that that's been in, in the regulation for a while, but I just want to examine the wording for a moment. And that is, just to put it in context, as I understand the overall legislative framework, statutes between the legislative law and the public officer's law say that you that there's a presumption if, you re, if a public official receives a gift from a client or lobbyist that that is improper, if not per se improper. Um, and there's a you know, the public officer's law that also says even if you're not a public, not a lobbyist or a client, um, then um, section five of or subdivision five of section seventy three says that if a public official receives a gift under circumstances in which it could be reasonably inferred that the gift was intended to influence that public official then that's wrong, too. The public official then has violated the law, too. Fine. The regulations create this definition that's not in the statute, interested source. And it says that even if you're not a client or not a lobbyist, if you have an interest in the activities of the legislator or the state official, then there's a presumption that it gets at that point um, also violates, I guess, 73 sub 5. That is the open-ended paragraph that says that a uh, public official is not to receive a gift under circumstances where it could be inferred that it was to, intended to influence. Fine. I have no problem with all of that. But you have to be very careful in your definition of interested source, which is what I want to hone in on, for two reasons because you're now talking about uh, activity where the person is not a client and not a lobbyist, and it could be post hoc that people will look at a gift and say, well, that person had an interest um, in whatever gift was given, and therefore the recipient uh, has violated the law presumptively for shifting the burden. And as I understand it, the interested source is not a, quote, covered person, 
which means that I don't think, unless I'm wrong, there's no penalty for the giver. It's only for the receiver. Stop me at any point if I'm wrong. But that's why we have to be careful here because you're talking about people who may have an interest in either legislation or executive action who give a gift. They're not a client. They're not a lobbyist. Uh, the, and now the recipient has violated the law. And so when I'm looking at subdivision one of uh, 19 NYCRR part 93321, which defines interested source, it says that a person who does business with a legislative member or employee, and I'm not sure what that means and I think we have to be careful in the definition there, because now you've got the legislator is guilty of accepting a gift, and it may not be that he or she knows that until a year later, um, based upon the fact that someone says, hey, by the way, that guy who gave you a gift had an interest in something you were doing. Um, so I, I would like to address that, but if I understand right now, in Albany there's a technical problem? <coughs> Yeah, I understand that there's an issue with the public feed uh, cutting in and out. Uh, we're trying to get an estimate on how long it's going to take to, I guess they're rebooting it right now, so if we can give it a minute, hopefully it'll address itself. Oh. Are you still meeting? Because they're trying to fix it. There's an issue. They're trying to we're, it. We're, we're paused. We're okay. waiting. All right. Because there's, there's an issue with the connection. I think they're getting it back. How long does it? I don't know. I don't know. Is it just the sound that's going in and out? Uh, no, I believe the video's frozen as well. How long is the reboot going to take? They're doing it now. I don't know what's happened, what the status is. We're back online. We're good to go? Yes. All right, Mr. Chair, we're all up. Okay, great. So, um, if I could just I, I can respond in part to some of the um, issues that Mr. Gates raised, and I think that providing more clarity is always something that we aim for, and if there's a way to provide that clarity in the advisory opinion, I think as we continue to work through it, that's something that we will look at. But, you know, the regulations are intended to provide guidance for, for um, individuals and entities subject to our jurisdiction and how to analyze these questions. And so what they conclude is whether or not a gift is presumptively permissible or presumptively impermissible. Under the circumstances where the public official who received a gift was not aware that, um, that the individual or entity that gave him the gift was an interest or her, gave her or him or her gift that was an interested source, that's something that I think the commission would then consider in whether or not to pursue a violation of law as an enforcement matter. And, and under public officer's law, obviously, to be subject to any penalties, the violation would have to be knowing and intentional. But the idea with the regulations is 
not um, to change the law, but is to provide guidance on how we interpret the law. And the uh, interested source was, was a convenience to say when these situations and circumstances are present, that there's more likely than not a, a type of conflict of interest or potential problem. So, you, you know, you should question whether to accept the gift. Um, and under those circumstances, the presumption is going to be against accepting the gift unless it would be unreasonable to infer that um, there was an intent to influence. So it's really an analysis, um, but it's about what the law says um, as to whether or not um, the gift is um, a violation of the law. And then, of course, we would, we would take into account all those factors in determining whether to pursue enforcement action. Okay, and just so I'm clear on my point, I, I support the notion of defining interested source in order to give clarity to people because if, I, if I'm an executive official or a legislative official and someone has an interest in something coming before me and gives me a gift, um, then I, I think there's a presumption there that should be included and I don't have a problem with that. My problem is, I'm just saying we need to be very careful about the language because when it says that a person's an interested source when they do business with a legislative member or staff person, I don't know what the heck that means. And that's my, that's my point. I'm not against the, the presumption or the definition or clarity. Um, Monica, the, the regulatory scheme has been in place for how many years now? I, I think the regs went into effect in, in 2014. We started working on the regs, I believe, in early 2013. So, so we since, had a whole. Since meeting. that time, has the commission been? Has anyone come forward to the commission, or any group who come forward to the commission, expressing concerns over any of the definitions of interested source, to your knowledge? Um. Yeah, me. It was pure and simple. Um, I, 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 Jim, Jim, I have a question. I have a question to staff. I'm asking. I'm asking yeah. if anyone has come forward to staff requesting that that specific provision about doing business be changed or be modified. Or have there been any enforcement issues uh, related to that, where where that language has presented problems? Not specifically in that way. Not about the doing business part. I think. It, there's been other issues that have come up with whether an entity is interested source. We, we look at these questions all the time in day-to-day -day guidance um, when we're asked whether or not someone can um, get reimbursed for um, state travel, uh, state-related travel from an outside entity. We have to look at whether or not it's an interested source. And so there have been questions in that area um, about whether or not they're doing business. But no one has actually challenged that part of the definition of, of interested source. Um, but we, I think that several commissioners have raised issues and concerns about the language of the advisory opinion. So I think that we should, staff will re re revisit the language of the advisory opinion. If any commissioners have additional issues or want to talk to staff about their concerns, please contact us. And we will hope to represent this advisory opinion at the February meeting. Um, as everyone in this room sees, it's a critical advisory opinion to provide clarity on how we are going to approach these problems and issues going forward. Um, and, and so we, we would like it to move along, but I think that we can, you know, continue to look at the language and um, we'll come back to this one. Great, thank you. Um, let's move on. Item six, is there any other business? Yes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I've been apprised that there is a practice, but I gather it is not a protocol actually adopted by the commission, that when the tenure of a commissioner ends, the staff requests that all documents pertaining to our deliberations that are in the possession of the exiting commissioner be returned back to staff. And uh, most recently, that request was made to former Commissioner Garcia. Could, could you just elaborate a bit, Monica, on that practice? Uh, yes, this practice dates back to, I believe, 2012. Um, but since 2012, um, or again, I believe it's 2012. I would have to confirm the date. But since around that time, after any commissioner has um, their term has ended or they have left the commission for whatever reason, 
um, staff or I have reached out to ask them to either return confidential documents in their possession or to just confirm in writing that they've destroyed confidential documents that are in their possession. Um, over the years that we've sent staff to pick up documents from commissioners, we've, we've had do commissioners ship documents back, um, or commissioners have sent um, you know, an email that has documented that they've returned or destroyed confidential records. And that's been the case with every commissioner um, who's left since we started this practice. Well, without addressing the merits, though, it is the case it's a practice, it's not a rule of the commission, correct? Yes, that is correct. I believe that the commission may have been involved when we first began it, um, but I would have to go back and check. Was this practice discussed with Mr. Friedman at the Inspector General's office subsequent to the rendering of the report on the leak? Subsequent to the the letter? Um, no, I don't believe it was. Has there been any further interaction between staff or anyone on behalf of the commission with the inspector general's office with respect either to the investigation of the leak or the proposals made by Mr. Friedman in his letter to us to uh, purportedly strengthen preserving confidence? Yeah. Has there been any interaction with the inspector general since the last meeting of the commission? I would have to double check, but I don't believe there has been any communication between, um, I mean, I'm the one who would have these communications, and I don't believe I've had any communication with respect to the issues that you're raising since the last meeting of the commission. But I would, I would have to double check. Um, whether I, there was something I had to follow up on. Well, do you anticipate, Mr. Chairman, at any juncture there's going to be a public discussion about what Mr. Friedman recommended to us? And it, we can take that up when we're in executive session, Gary. All right. Uh, I want to move on to another subject, if I may ask staff. Has there been any activity to review proposals that we might make to reform or strengthen the ethics apparatus. In other words, is the staff involved in any work that might be preparatory to the commission making specific proposals to the governor and to the legislature during this session? I think staff is constantly thinking about potential reforms that could be made to our laws, and we have the ongoing discussions about those. Um, there's a couple of issues that um, commissioners have <coughs> asked us to look into and add to further discussion. Um, I don't know whether or not those would be matters that would be considered by the commission for presentations for this session. Mr. Chairman, there are uh, three significant subjects that I believe ought to command our attention with respect to consideration of fundamental statutory changes. Number one, with respect to the Inspector General, uh, the Inspector General ought to have a term of office to ensure a dispassionate, objective investigations. In the alternative, uh, I believe consideration ought to be given to the proposal made in 2009 by the then State Investigation Commission that the Office of Inspector General be abolished and folded into a new Ethics and Enforcement Commission, which would also replace us. Uh, number two, uh, I believe that very serious consideration should be given to making the confidentiality protocols on what we can divulge with respect to our deliberations uh, less restrictive. Uh, specifically, I believe that the commission should have the same prerogative that the appellate division, the appellate divisions have under sections 9010 of the judiciary law to divulge confidential matters in, with respect to the appellate divisions having to do with attorney disciplinary matters uh, for good cause. Uh, we uh, institutionally ought to be able to divulge any confidential matter that we deem appropriate if there is good cause. The third area, in my view, that ought to be addressed is the sham 
that's what it is, financial disclosure exercises. As I understand it, we're now getting 30,000 of these submitted. It's a complete waste of time. Uh, we ought to uh, very seriously consider, and the legislature and the governor ought <coughs> to consider, a bifurcated approach in which a, the top tier of policymakers in the state administration and state government uh, would be identified and continue to file a long form, which, by the way, ought to be simplified in any event. Everybody else would file a short form. So those are three areas that I believe that ought to be addressed. And, Mr. Chairman, I move, actually, that the staff uh, consider this and any other proposal with respect to their feasibility and advisability and report back to us at the February meeting so we can have a discussion about reforms to be proposed to the legislature and the governor. Thank you, Commissioner. I don't think that that requires a formal motion. <clears throat> if you might staff to look into these things and report back to us on the same reason why they shouldn't do that. So thank you, Monica and Marvin, please um, get on that. Thank you very much. Anything else? Okay. So this concludes the uh, public session of the January meeting. Can I have a motion, please, to enter into executive session? I'll move. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Levine. Second. I'll second. Commissioner Fisher. Thank you. All in favor? New York City. Albany. <coughs> and WebEx. And WebEx. Hey, stand by. Thank you. We are adjourned. Thanks, everybody. See you next month. Thank you. Take care. Thank you.